been building since last year. And now we are looking at an extremely constrained environment. It started with two big factory fires at Japanese semiconductor plants, one in July, one in October. Then there were some labor strikes at chip making facilities in Europe. And then you combine that with the upheaval from COVID. We had fires in California, record hurricane season, winter storms, the container issues that we have experienced container shortages. And then we saw Boeing 777 grounding, which ground, which affects air shipment capacity. And just last week, we heard that in Taiwan, there is a water shortage that is creating constrained water supplies, which are very essential for wafer fabrication assembly operations. So it's a very interesting situation right now. Now we have the Biden administration saying, we're going to get our arms around this. We're going to start with information, making sure we know what's going on. Something I think you may have some insight into in ResoLink. Is that the right first step? Absolutely. In fact, I would say the direction that the government is going with supply chain right now, they first, uh, most critical, they have called supply chain resilience a matter of national security. This is the first thing that they needed to do, and they have finally done it. Um, understanding the supply chain landscape, who the critical players are, what are the global sites and regions that are critical to the supply chain, this is the first step in helping us make informed decisions about what are those sources of constrained supply that we need to address, where we need to hold backup supplies, where we need to hold extra inventory, and what it is that we need to do to avoid the similar problems that we experienced in PPE shortages last year that brought the healthcare industry to their knees. So it's really critical and, and mapping supply chains and understanding those global dependencies is the first step. Have we been spending too little on our supply chain? Because as I listen to you and as you talk about increased inventories, increased capacity, that sounds like money, that we, in fact, we've been running at too tight a tolerance. Absolutely. Well, the first thing we did in the last 20 years is we went um, overseas and uh, globalized. Not the wrong thing to do. Uh, you not only globalize your supply chain to take advantage of lo lower cost supplies, you take advantage of emerging markets and the demand there as well. But the problem is that we have a globally stretched supply chain that also embraced lean in a big way and just in time. So we now stretch the supply chain and took all the buffer out. And we fail to simultaneously provide any protection for all the things that, as I mentioned, constantly go wrong. And for far too long, supply chain risk has been a nice to have. And I think that we're seeing firsthand what what happens when those types of all things go can, that can go wrong have now gone wrong, and this is what we are dealing with. So coming to something that's near and dear to my heart, what happened to the auto industry? Uh, because I interviewed Mary Barrow just a couple of weeks ago, and they're projecting next year they're going to leave a lot of money on the table because they will have a shortage of chips. Why did the auto industry particularly get caught out here? You know, automakers need to recognize your supply chains now resemble a high-tech electronic product supply chain. In that sector, we have major players that have long standing relationships with those suppliers. And the high tech industry has led the world in developing and embracing to a great degree some of the best in class supply chain practices.